Assalamu alaikum everyone. You are listening to episode 50 of the Muhammad Ghailan podcast with yours truly as the host. It has been a while. Um, I'm, I'm really bad at remembering when I have uh, something coming up uh, to, re- to remember to mention this on the podcast. So unfortunately, I record, I have a good run, and then all of a sudden I disappear, and then I get a few of you uh, listeners uh, checking up and wondering what's going on. And uh, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the loyalty. I appreciate the excitement over the episodes. I really do appreciate you guys listening. Uh, and I apologize for not uh, you know, letting you know ahead of time if I'm going to you know, have to put a pause on things. Uh, recently, over the past uh, couple months, I've been traveling. I went back home after my exams to visit the family in Vancouver, then went to Toronto, attended the uh, revival, revival of the Islamic Spirit Knowledge Retreat, uh, their six-day retreat, which was a wonderful time. I got to catch up with people I haven't seen in like six, seven years, which was just amazing. Um, uh, Taimur and, and uh, Amazon, and it was just wonderful. So it was, um, you know, just Kazem, just people that I haven't seen in six, seven years, and it was great to see them again. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I went back home. I had the intention of recording a podcast episode. Uh, As I mentioned before, these these recordings happen in real time. So unlike many other podcasts, I don't record a bunch and then I release them later on. I I record and then I release right away. So I had the intention of recording something when I got back from Toronto to Vancouver for uh, to finish my holidays there, and um, I went to bed when I landed. I landed back home. I went to bed. Did not get up the next morning. Um, I woke up, but I couldn't get up out of bed. Um, this was the nastiest round of uh, the flu I've ever had. Uh, the last time I remember being that ill, and it was actually very similar to the same kind of symptoms, was when I got malaria back in, oh God, late 90s, I think it was, when I had malaria. Oh no, in 2000. 2000 was the last time I got malaria when I went to Sudan. And um, yeah, it, that was... That was an intense seven days uh, where I genuinely thought I was, I was saying my shahada every night when I was going to bed because that was how bad it was. And then that was followed by a round of coughing, which just recently stopped a few days ago, alhamdulillah. Um, But uh, it was just this nagging, um, just lingering cough that just wouldn't go away, which basically... I, I can't record a podcast when I have to cough every two, three words. So that had to be paused. So alhamdulillah, you know, you you intend something and, and you plan for something, but Allah makes uh, the decree go with what Allah wanted. So better late than never, I guess. We're back at it again. Um, at this podcast episode, I'm going to move the listener interactions to be the, uh, instead of, I was intending for this to be podcast 51 for the listener interactions, I'm going to move it to 50, 60, 70, as long as Allah wills it and if we remain on, alive on this earth, this is when these listener interactions are going to be moved to now. And um, because I was, it's been a while, I decided to go through basically as many of the Facebook messages that I've received uh, over the past while. And uh, there was quite a few, but I tried to take out the ones that have the more, let's say, general applicability for everybody uh, so that you know the, the topic being asked about would resonate with a lot of you and maybe some of you even though the uh, the questioner has something specific to them but the general uh, topic that's being asked and the general answer that I probably will end up offering here might be hopefully beneficial for everybody else so with that uh, just a note uh, for those of you whose names I'm going to mention um, some of you who did not tell me to to remain anonymous because of the sensitivity of the subject. I just assumed you would rather be anonymous, so I did not include your name. If the subject was not really that sensitive and you didn't ask to be a, to remain anonymous, I'm going to mention your name so that you um, uh, so that you know it's you. And and I read everybody's questions, by the way. I read everybody's messages. I'm not able to answer everybody. Uh, just a note for some listeners who work with organizations and whatnot. I have received requests for um, seminars, for talks, for things like that. But unfortunately, because of the volume of messages that I get over Facebook, some of these messages get buried, and I don't find them until it's too late. So if you would like to get a hold of me for uh, an organizational event of some sort, for a lecture, for a talk, for a seminar, for a webinar, whatever the case may be, 
you are better off going to endlessonline.org through the contact form because I'll get that directly and um, my inbox does not get overflown with uh, messages from the contact form there. So I'll be able to see it at a much faster pace and I'll be able to respond to you in due time. Uh, it's unfortunate that there were a few requests that I just um, I just came across today, literally, and uh, many of them, the time has passed for when they wanted me to um, uh, do something with them. So my apologies for all of you. My apologies to those who send messages and I don't include them here in the podcast or, uh, you know, I, I do try to get as many as possible, uh, but I hope you just bear with me. There's quite a few people and I'm trying to keep this as um, uh, having general applicability as, pos applicability as possible, uh, while at the same time acknowledging your questions and your concerns and whatnot. So without further ado, uh, starting off with Aisha Afzal, I'm going into my third year of undergrad soon, and I'm really confused about what steps to take for my future. And I'm wondering if you could perhaps offer some advice, offer me some advice. Uh, if one is entering into third year and has completely lost passion for their program, which in my case is political science, should one push through the next two years or just redo their degree? My true love seems to be psychology, but I shudder at the thought of having wasted money on two years worth of studies. Um, <clears throat> well, number one, you didn't waste money on two years worth of studies. Um, you have learned something, you have grown in some way. Uh, any new knowledge that you attain impacts you in a way that is going to shape your uh, worldview perspectives, your character, you've grown. So don't, number one, don't look at this as you wasted two years of study. Number two, um, you might wanna look into the sunk costs fallacy. The sunk costs fallacy. It's an economic principle which uh, basically states that the way that people operate and the way that they make decisions uh, to switch paths or to you know, uh, take a different course of action is often impacted by the current path that they're on. And if it happens to be a path that is no longer desirable or is no longer producing the results that they wish for, because of the time and energy and um, uh, money that has been invested into this path, many people end up just biting the bullet and continuing on because they don't want to quote unquote waste, have that thing go to waste. Um, an example of that that we often do on a day-to-day -day basis, and I, I get to do it, I, I live on a second floor in an apartment building, and, um, uh, you know, I, I get lazy sometimes, so I just want to get on the elevator and just, you know, go down to the ground floor or whatever, and uh, I could just take the stairs. It's quick. I can just move on and just be active, but when I'm feeling lazy, I press it, and then oftentimes in the weekend when somebody's moving in or moving out, one of the elevators is already... Uh, locked up, uh, locked away for that person that's moving in or moving out. And then we have one elevator. And then I could stand there, you know, it could take two, three, four minutes between all the different floors and all the different people that are going up and down. And because I had pressed the button and I had already waited for a minute, two minutes, then I just think like, oh, all that time is wasted. I don't want to really uh, get, you know, just leave it. So you... But I don't, I actually just, uh, once it takes longer than 30 seconds, I'm out the door, the exit door, just to go down the stairs, it's a lot faster. But the idea here is many people, what they'll do is they'll just wait. And they'll think that I, don't, I wasted all this time because that time that I waited was uh, intended for me to get into this elevator. And if I leave, then that time has been wasted. That type of thinking actually results in you wasting more resources and more energy and ending up in a position that you do not want to be in in the first place. Like right now, Aisha, you're saying that you spent the last uh, three years doing this thing. You realize that this is not the path that you want to be on. Now you're talking about spending an additional two years to top it off just for the sake of not having this feeling of I wasted all of this time. My recommendation to you and, you know, uh, many people don't find this popular because of this uh, thinking of sunk costs, uh, sunk costs and not wanting to waste it or whatever, is don't feel shy about just starting up, you know, with the program uh, for psychology and the requirements for it. If that's really what you're passionate about and that's really what you want to study and want to continue to pursue, there is no sense in you spending an additional two years um, in a program that you do not like 
in a, studying a subject that you don't want to study anymore, in fact, what you're going to end up doing is going to demoralize you. It's going to eat up inside you a little bit, and you're not going to perform to, you're not going to have your potential really come out. So I would say you did not waste your time. That was not money wasted. You learned something. You gained something. In fact, when you do restart a psychology program right now to, let's say, that you're going to go back all the way from the start, if you're at a, a Western university, the idea, the typical thing is that some of your courses might be transferable as electives. So it's not like you're starting completely from scratch. But never mind that. Let's say that you're starting completely from scratch. You are going to come into the program. In comparison to other students, you've spent three years in university. You know how these, the, this institution works. Uh, your approach to studying, to the subjects, it's going to have a different approach. That's why a lot of mature students, when they go back to school, they learn faster. They're able to comprehend things quicker. Uh, they're able to add two and two together better. Some programs, if you look at uh, some MBA programs, uh, their requirement is that you have worked for three years or not. What's the point behind that? It's because they wanted you to have had experience that you're going to come in and bring to bear on the program. So the same thing here. You have experience in university. You've studied things. You have a perspective. And political science is really not that far removed from psychology in terms of what motivates and how people think and, and what moves the crowds and how systems of governance operate from a human perspective, you can bring all of that to bear on your study of psychology. So I would say, you know, w without making dragging this too long, go ahead and just uh, go into the program that you wish to start on. And there's no need for you to spend an additional two years or three, uh, an additional time, two years, in something that you don't want to do. So that's that. Uh, let's see. Uh, not anonymous. That's the next one. I wanted to know your scattered thoughts on practicing yoga. So scattered thoughts, for those who don't know, that was a series that I started. And I didn't officially end it, so I guess it's kind of left open-ended. I might restart it again at some point. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's my YouTube channel. There's like something like 70 videos or whatever. Um, so he wants this individual, he or she, I can't remember, but it's anonymous. I wanted to know your scattered thoughts on practicing yoga, meditation, and mindfulness. That is all the rage. Um, that is all the rage these days. Do you think it's okay to say um and go to these classes? I'm surprised how many Muslims think it's fine, but I'm not so sure. Yet I do find many benefits from yoga as well. I know our prayer is similar to some yoga poses. To add to this, it seems as though Muslims are made to believe in this Western culture that we cannot find peace in Islam itself, but need, quote-unquote, extra or other less, quote-unquote, scary uh, ways of finding peace without consequence. That we can pray, um, uh, but to find, uh, that we can pray, but to find real peace is through yoga and meditation on top of prayers. Is it possible to practice yoga a little, since it's good for your health physically and emotionally, and pray, or should we condemn it as shirk and abandon it Totally. Um, well, what I would say is um, <sighs> yoga is uh, just, uh, let's preempt it with the answer. The an uh, let's preempt my comments on this with the answer. The answer that you are looking for is that generally speaking, you will find scholars that will condemn it as uh, an act of polytheism, participating in polytheism, and that you should not participate in that and, th and therefore just, um, you know, don't do it because it's so linked to Hinduism and Buddhism and whatever. So it's impermissible for you to do it. The other way of looking at it is uh, as long as you do the physical poses, but you do not engage in the, um, uh, the mantras. So as long as you just practice the physical element of it, uh, the physical exercise part of it, but don't do the meditative or the mantras, um, then you're fine because you'll be benefiting from the physical act and uh, you're no longer going to be engaging in the mantras and whatnot. I don't know about this. I, it, uh, what, what I'm going to say is not to say do it or don't do it. I just want you to reflect on this and just think about it for a little bit. Um, the thing about yoga, it's, it, the, the term itself, the word yoga, from the Sanskrit, the, the Sanskrit uh, root word, yogi, I think is how you pronounce it, to yoke, is generally translated as this union between the individual atma or this, you know, the soul, 
uh, with the uh, paramatma, which is or the paramatma, which is this universal soul. It's in other words, it's it's they're talking about hulul <laughs> for the Arabs out there. They're talking about this union between God and and human, this uh, d- this melting in together of the two, and so it's the union of the divine and the body, the mind and the spirit all coming together. Um, so in essence, when you're when you're doing yoga, you're really trying to do this unification process. That's from a, uh, from what I understand. That's how it's understood from a Hindu perspective. And the postures themselves, the 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 poses that you engage in in yoga, they're not simply just physical poses. These poses are poses that are uh, constructed in a way to basically. Uh, give an offering to one of the 300 some odd million Hindu gods. Each pose that you you do in yoga is meant to represent something where you're bringing an offering to a small letter G god. Um, so if you're doing these things, you're and, and that in, including the breathing, the way that you breathe, the way that they tell you to breathe, uh, the way that you pose, the way that you meditate. Um, all of that, when you combine it together, then it's becoming accepted by one of these 300 some odd million gods. So, I don't know. that it's When you look at it, I, let's flip the script a little bit and think about it from another perspective. Imagine, just for a second, that there are, because uh, right now you have yoga, what are they called? Yoga centers, let's say, or yoga gyms or whatever. Imagine, for a second, that there are a bunch of salah centers. Salah centers, Salah uh, gyms, and then you have a bunch of Westerners, a bunch of non-Muslims. Uh, when you pass by and you look through the window, all you see them do are engaging in bowing, rukur, sujood, in prostration, uh, the sitting of the tashahud, they're sitting there. And, um, and then for the mantras... Uh, they're saying in the rukur, subhana rabbi al-azim, and then in the sujood, they say, subhana rabbi al-a'la. Um, imagine this. And then they stand for a while, and then for the mantra, they get told, all right, now say after me. You know, in the sense of like the hippie type of new age. Say after me, alhamdulillahi rabbi al-alameen. And then they, you have them actually recite the fatiha. And meanwhile, they're non-Muslim, but they're just going to do all of these things. And then at the end of the thing, and then they say, okay, now say after me, assalamu alaikum. And then they say, assalamu alaikum. And then they get up and they roll their mats, or they fold their mats, let's say, because, you know, salah mats are not rollable. So they fold their mats, and then they tie them up and put them on their backpack, and then they get on the bus and walk. It's just, if you think, and then for their gear, the yoga gear, so you have the yoga gear, which is the yoga pants and all of that stuff. Instead of yoga, you have salah stuff. So you'll have the women wearing the hijab, and engaging in the poses and stuff, and the men will also have their proper attire to make sure that they cover the necessary parts, right? And and then afterwards, maybe they have masbahas, and they sit there, and they do the tasbih. And non-Muslim, they're non-Muslim. None of them is saying the shahada as a Muslim. They're just engaging in this practice for the purpose of just, you know, self-actualization and physical exercise. The bowing helps my back. The prostration helps with my flexibility. If you think about it like that, it just it sounds really silly. And then it's like, oh, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I got to go to my salah. I got to go do my salah session. You know, it's going to take, and I got to, you know, and then when Ramadan comes and they go, all go do taraweeh and stuff like that, and they just engage in all this, but they're non-Muslim. And the purpose of all of this is to just find, you know, the stillness that they're looking for and, and um, to find this uh, physical stretching and exercise and all of that stuff. When you think about it like that, like this sounds really silly, and nobody would ever do that. But that's actually what everybody's doing with yoga. If yoga itself is a derivative of a practice that is from a, a an Eastern religion, they have their different takes on it. They have their different forms of it. They have their different yogi masters or whatever. And then even the yogi masters. I think that if I, when I if I remember correctly, I came across there's like four different types of yoga. In essence, they're all kind of doing serving the same function, and they can all be similar in some way. But there's something different about each of them. I'm not totally familiar with it. But and, and so when I read that, I was like, 
that sounds like, all right, so you have a Hanafi yoga, you have a Maliki yoga, you have a Shafi'i yoga, and you have an Hanbali yoga, and then you engage in all of these different, so basically you have Salah centers, where it's like, all right, I'm going to go to the Malikis, I'm going to go to the Shafi'is, and, and then people are just like, oh yeah, the Shafi'i one is really good, I feel really nice with this one, and the other one's like, the yoga, the Maliki one is better because I dislocated my shoulder and I can just put my hands on my sides and I don't have to worry about it. So it's just, when you think about it, it just seems really silly. But that's actually what people are doing with yoga. So, and it's not like yoga is the only exercise out there. It's all right. So you, you left out all the spiritual mantras. You left out all the meditative part of it. You're not engaged in any of that. But then you say, all right, I'm just going to do the exercise. All right, so what is left from the practice? Just a bunch of stretching and, and, and poses where you hold the stretch for a little while. and stuff. All right, you can stretch. Like You don't have to do it as yoga. You can just stretch and do your own exercise. So... What makes it yoga is this package. And when you look at what the package entails, the package entails religious practices from an Eastern religion. And then you're going to say that I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to engage in all. So it's almost like you're a Muslim Hindu, but you're not really a Hindu. You're a Muslim, but you're going to do all of the practices the Hindu does. I don't know. It's just something to think about. Like I said, this is not me telling you halal, haram, or any of that. I want you to... You know, for Muslims out there, we all need to think a little bit more about these practices and and um, get beyond the simple legal distinctions of I just want to know if it's halal or haram so that I can just do it. you got to think a little bit about the practice and the behavior that you're engaging in. And when you think about this particular practice and behavior, it just seems really silly. The same thing with like uh, with uh, Christmas because, you know, I'm recording this January 29th, uh, Brisbane time. Um, just Christmas last month. I, I When I was visiting Vancouver, I was talking to my sister and... There are a lot of Muslims now are starting to just celebrate Christmas full on. Like they're just bringing the trees and they're getting the gifts and the presents and doing all of these things. I'm just thinking, like, you know, if you have, when have you ever seen non-Muslims come Eid al-Fitr time or no? Let's say Eid al-Adha because there's even more to it. Eid al-Adha time comes and then they all go to the farmers and they all buy lamb and sheep and then they all slaughter and they all engage in all of the pra- but they don't do the Eid prayer. Yeah, because they're not Muslim. They're not going to go to the Eid prayer. But lo and behold, they're going to go to the farm. They're going to buy sheep. They're going to buy cows. They're going to buy whatever. They're going to do the slaughter. They're going to buy, you know, distribute the meat in, in accordance to the sunnah. They're going to have a gathering. They're going to have people come together. They're going to have all the sweets and all the... the you'd never see that. But Muslims go ahead and do all of this stuff. And it's just like, what's the... Is culture really that important to you? Like the, the, Or are you that weak that the dominant culture that you happen to live in in a Western society basically impacts you to such a degree that you can't even have a backbone to say, this is not something that I do. I'm, I'm a Muslim. And I think this is really a byproduct of... I've uh, got to do another episode on this, but... Just a byproduct of us having turned our religion into a, a, a ritual religion that is privatized and it has no impact on your public behavior and on your social behavior anymore. So you just kind of engage in the ritual aspect of it, but it really has nothing else to do with the rest of your life. And uh, byproducts of colonialism, byproducts of just inferiority complexes and whatnot. So anyways, I'll just leave it at that. I hope this just kind of you know triggers a little bit of thought for you guys. Tariq James, Assalamu alaikum. I listened to you on Mad Mamluks and really enjoyed your conversation about philosophy. I wanted to know how a Muslim could use an idea like Pascal's Wager. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Pascal's Wager is basically, in a nutshell, if you believe in God, then when you die, you are saved. You can go to paradise. And if, and if you believe in God and practice, you know, let's say from, as a Muslim would say it, um, you believe in Allah, you believe in the Messenger Sallallahu you believe in the Quran, you engage in all the practices, but you're not, you know, you're doing it just as a, as a wager that if, if it's true, then at least I'm going to be saved and I'm going to go to paradise. And if it's not true, then I didn't harm anybody. Um, I had a good life. And uh, so in both cases, I win. That's really what it is. If I die, then I'm, I'm dead, I'm done, and there's nothing else. Then at least I had a good life, and it was a righteous life, and um, it was beneficial in that way for me psychologically. If, you know, if the spirit doesn't exist, at least psychologically it was good. That's how you would phrase it if you're talking about a Muslim. You cannot use that as a Muslim. There is no such thing as an accepted Pascal's wager from an Islamic perspective. If you're going to be a believer in Islam, you're going to have to accept this religion wholeheartedly as a believer, that you have certainty in it. Uh, uh, even the word dhan in the Quran when Allah uses it when it comes to the believer 
uh, that they have dhan, they adhunun annahum mulaqu rabbihim, that they believe that they have the cert, the dhan, the mufassirun, the scholars of tafsir say, this is actually talking about yaqeen, that you have the certainty that you're going to be with Allah. So how do you gain the certainty? You're not going to gain it just through rational discourse. I can tell you that for sure. Um, if you have a debate or a discussion with anybody from an opposing side, whether it's atheist or uh, Christian or Buddhist, Hindu, whatever it is, if all you're going to rely on is rational discourse, you're always going to have this element of doubt in your heart. And that's why I always refer people back to Imam al-Ghazali. Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, go look at, um, there is a, in the video section in Andalus Book Club, I put a series uh, covering his text, Al-Muqib min al-Dalal, Deliverance from Error. And Imam al-Ghazali, this was his, his spiritual autobiography, where he just goes through how did he gain the certainty. There's no longer Pascal's wager. How did he gain certainty? Because he was in this position of doubt. I know that this religion is true. And we're talking about somebody who wrote major texts in Aqidah. He knows the proofs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all these things. But he still had that element of doubt. And he said when he perused, when he go, went through all of the different groups that he studied, he still could not gain that certainty. And the only people he got certainty from is what he called the Sufis. And the reason for that is because لِأَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ فَرَأَيْتُ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ أَحْوَالُ وَلَيْسُ أَصْحَابُ أَقْوَالُ That I saw in them that they are peoples of stations and states, not peoples of statements. So if you're going to get away from this Pascal's wager from a Muslim perspective, Imam al-Ghazali tells you that what you're going to have to do is apply the religion in your life and follow the prescriptions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told you to do X, Y, and Z. So you're going to engage in doing X, Y, and Z for the Americans and Z for the Canadians. So that's what you're going to have to do. And when you engage in this practice, what you will find, and I, I was asked this in the debate that I had with uh, Professor Peter Slozak, which you can find on my YouTube channel, on uh, if God exists, where is he? Uh, I was asked by somebody, one of the audience members, how do, why are you a Muslim? How do you believe? Why do you believe in Islam being the one true way? And in, the answer in a nutshell is, this is the only religion where the rational discourse is synthesized with the experiential part of this religion where after you engage in the practices, they both support each other in a way that there is no other religion that does it. I don't care what it is. You can have an experiential part in Christianity, for example, you experience the presence of God as you might feel it. But when you go into the theology, you're going to have questions that you will not have answers for because they will clash with the irrational part. That There are some irrational statements being proposed from a Christian side and also from a Buddhist and a Hindu side. And so you're, you might have the experience, but you're not going to have the rational part coming in. It's only Islam where you the rational and the experiential can be combined together in a harmonious way. So that's what I would say about that, Tariq. Um, there's no such thing as Pascal's wager. It's not, that's not an accepted belief in Islamic theology that you have a wishy-washy, I'm not sure, so I'm just gonna do it just in case. Jatan Osmani, I have a hard time reflecting on the biological creation of God. For example, when I see a person, animal, or even a plant-like species, I can tell that it requires intelligence to create such an object. However, when I piece the object to the cellular level in my mind, I have trouble understanding the creation process. For example, when a baby is in the nine-month process of creation, is it God that assembles and replicates the cells, or is it the genetic information that the cells divide up and form into a baby? Or another example, when a person eats food, is it God that breaks up the nutrients and disperses them into uh, to the body, or is it the metabolism and hyper-advanced system? Or another example, when a person puts himself into stress, for example, lifting weights, is it God that makes the muscles stronger, or is it microbiological evolution that does that, um, that does it? The advent on combining, uh, the advantage on combining materialism with biology really Oh, no, the advent, I'm not sure what, the, maybe the advantage, on combining materialism with biology really boggles my mind. And I have so many unanswered questions when I reflect on the biological creation of God. Um, Jetin, um, I think it would be useful for you to pick up a book by David uh, Bentley Hart, The Experience of God, 
because a lot of what you're asking will be answered there. We covered it uh, at the end of last year in Andalus Book Club. And uh, the webinar, it's like a two-hour long webinar video is available for you to watch if you'd like to hear my commentary and my explanations on that. But just quickly, the, what you're asking about is contingency. Contingency means that everything is reliant on something else. So when you talk about, for example here, uh, cellular level and uh, the process of uh, the baby coming together and cells replicating, how are these cells doing that? Is it something from within themselves that this generate, they're freely generating this activity from within themselves? We know that that's not true. The simple fact that you might have information is not enough for that information to be actualized and assembled. The information does not move itself and assemble itself and drive its own process. That's actually one of the problems with evolutionary theory that we might have. Um, and that's really where the crux of all of this evolutionary theory problems come in. Uh, it's not so much about how things were created. It's more about the philosophical underpinnings and the assumptions that people make with regards to it, which stem from materialism. The claims that you're making here, uh, or that you're asking about here, it's an underlying assumption to the question itself that you're asking, which is you're assuming that the cell is able to operate on its own without an external force that allows it to operate without an external life-giving force that allows it to go through. Moreover, you're assuming that as the cell operates, it will operate towards a purpose. For example, you're assuming that the process of creation of a baby from start to finish at nine months, you're thinking that, or you're, you're assuming here, just an underlying assumption to your question, is that if you just put the information together, if you just bring the DNA together, it will necessarily drive itself all the way through to forming that baby. Which, if you look into the matter, that is not the case. Just the simple fact of putting a bunch of DNA together in a Petri dish is not enough for you to generate that baby the way that it is. Moreover, just having a bunch of adenine, guanine, cytosine, uh, thymine, uracil around for the RNA, just having these bases around is not enough for them to assemble in the way that they assemble to form that sequence of DNA, that, that, that particular sequence of DNA. And then when you have transcription and then translation of that transcription to RNA and then translation into protein, it is not, there is nothing actually in the process here that says it must form the protein and then form the protein into this folded structure that it forms in. There are literally millions of confirmations that you can get from for each protein. Why does that protein choose uh, or it's not choosing? Why does that protein get into that particular form out of all the other forms that are also possible? And in some cases, they are lower in energy uh, requirements than the, the confirmation that it's in. There is nothing in the process that explains any of this stuff. And I'm just touching on the surface here for you, uh, Jaren. So uh, the, the question here is contingency. Again, all of these things are reliant upon an external force that determines how these things unfold in the way that they unfold. So the creation, and, and an, in addition to that, just as a side note, technically speaking, from an Ash'ari perspective, we don't actually believe in cause and effect in Islam. Every instant is a creative, a created instant. So when you give the example, for example, of lifting weights, I'm not the one lifting the weights. My muscles are not the ones lifting the weights. These are all created instants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings into existence. And so in each instant that you see the weights are down on the floor, the weights are all of a sudden up on the bench, the weights are all of a sudden over my head. The, the, so you're seeing these created instants. What I'm doing, that's where my free will comes in, as Allah creates these instants, there are created possibilities for these things to happen. And my free will comes in in choosing which possibility that I'm going with. That's where my free will comes in. And maybe we'll have another episode on that. But the point that I'm just trying to drive home for you here is what you're, what you're asking about is about contingency. And if you want an elaborate discussion of that, pick up the book by David Bentley Hart, The Experience of God. And if you are not, um, not everybody likes to read and sit down for hours on and doing that. Some people are better at listening and watching things. So you can go and watch the webinar where we discuss many of the ideas uh, for that at Endless Book Club. I hope that 
kind of, uh, if you notice that I'm not trying to completely answer the question for you, but I want you to start thinking about it because there is a, an element of, there's value to you coming to that conclusion on your own because you remember it once you do. Oh, and another thing, Jetan and anybody that's interested and who hasn't listened to those, you can go to my SoundCloud account. Uh, you can go to my SoundCloud page and also to my YouTube channel where you'll find a playlist for, uh, is it nine or 10 videos and 10 recordings, 10 lessons. Uh, it's a series of explaining the Aqidatul Najat by, by Muhammad ibn Jafar al-Kittani. Uh, it is the creed of deliverance, and it's an introductory text on Islamic theology, where I also touch on these subjects. Um, so that might help you out a little bit there, too. I can say that it might because I've been getting, to this day, I still continue to receive messages from a lot of Muslim brothers and sisters who listened to it, and they found that it answered a lot of questions similar to yours. So hopefully that helps out. Hafsa. My question is related to marriage. It is threefold. Uh, all right. The first one. I was wondering what your thoughts were about the following saying. إِذَا خَطَبَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوا تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ عَرِيضٌ That whoever comes to you seeking to be married to, let's say, your daughter, uh, and you accept that person's religion, the, their religious qualities, as well as their character, then go ahead with the marriage. And if you, Because if you don't do that, you're going to end up with mass corruption in the earth that is going to be uh, widely spread. The second point, what would be a, a good Islam-founded and realistic approach to choosing a husband, in your opinion? The way I do it is I consider proposals based on religion, behavior, and sophistication. I consult my heart, and then I consult Allah. And then thirdly, finally, what do you think about proposing to a guy? All right, um, well, the, the first point with regards to the mass corruption and widespread it is happening, mass corruption and widespread. Um, there are so many cases, and it's really sad to see, of perfectly uh, uh, eligible couples, you know, the people that can, they, they're a good match for each other, everything is fine, but for whatever reason, the families bring up their cultural baggage, they bring up their, their histories, they bring up whatever it is, basically everything that does not matter. In the grand scheme of things, things that don't, you know, when the Messenger of Allah says, Tunkahu um, al-mar'atu li arba'a, that the, a woman is married for four reasons. Li jamaliha wa maliha wa nasabiha wa dinihha. Fadfar bi dhati dini taribat yadak. She, a woman is married for four reasons. One reason is her beauty. The other reason is her wealth. The third reason is her lineage. And the fourth reason is her religion. So win over, fadfar. Win over the one, that's a beautiful way of, that the Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam puts it, فضفر, win over, win over the one who is, has the religion. That's when you'll be successful. That hadith actually is not restricted to just women. You can also flip the gender here for the men as well. So for our sisters out there, a man could be married for four reasons. His, his handsome good looks, his wealth, his uh, lineage, family, which family he comes from, or his religion. And the Messenger وسلم, is telling you, win over the man who is going to have the religion side, and that's when you'll be successful. So when people don't do that, you know, when you look at so many different cases, Muslims like to pay a lot of lip service, which is quite annoying to the religion. Oh yeah, make sure it's the religion side. Once they look at the religion side and the religion side is fine, all of a sudden that gets put on the back burner and then everybody starts talking about everything else with regards to family, with regards to um, uh, money, with regards to career, with regards to I don't know what, you can just come up with any reason that you want and you will have families just going through a list of things and religion becomes the least important thing. And you will have... This very important thing, not really considered at the end of the day because many of them do not proceed and go forward because everything else didn't matter. Everything else mattered more. Everything else was more important to people. And what's interesting about this, check this out. Limaliha, you know, looking at the wealth side of things. If you really had 
tawakkul and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and an understanding, a proper understanding of Islamic cosmology, you would recognize that when it comes to wealth, everything was written. We strive, yes, we go and we study and we try to find good jobs and good careers and we, and we try to, yeah, and some of us are, have more ambition and they want to go and get rich and all that stuff. That's fine. You, you go ahead and do that. Strive for all these things. But at the end of the day, the wealth is not your business. That's God's business. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already distributed the wealth before you came into this world, before you even were a thought in your parents' minds. You were already, be, from the time of your great-great-grandparents, you had your, when Allah created you, when you were in Alam al dhar in the atomic realm, your wealth, your sustenance was already written for you. And the fact is, you're not going to get any more than what was written for you, and you're not going to depart from this world with any less than what was written for you. The day you die, that is going to be the day that you use your final atoms of oxygen and breathe out your final atoms of carbon dioxide. Because even that was written for you. So to focus on something that is really outside of the control of the person, that's not, you know, and, and the way that it's just it's silly. It's not, it doesn't make sense for me personally. I just, I don't get it. The second one, uh, the beauty. Marrying somebody because they're good looking. I could tell you something. Um, beauty is something that is temporal. And beauty is something that usually strikes a person initially. And it strikes them until they get it. But once you get married and you get used to the person, yeah, you might find, you might find them handsome still. But there are the things that are going to come into play that will make that person more beautiful or they're going to make them downright ugly for you. And that is going to be their character how their character is going to be. If they're a horrible person, I don't care how good looking you found them initially, there will be just a veil of ugliness that you will see all the time. And if their character is beautiful, that person all of a sudden, every day you'll just find them more attractive. You'll find them more beautiful because of their character. But when it comes to the physical beauty part, just the physical aspect of it, if we just think physically, you'll get used to it. People get older. And then that initial thing that struck you doesn't strike you as much anymore. So that's, so, you know, looking after that, this very temporal physical thing. And when you really think about it, that's an animalistic thing. Animals do that. Um, that's how they choose mates by displays of beauty and displays of and prowess and whatnot. And that's how the female will reject somebody. And that's how the male will go after a female. So, I think humans should elevate over that a little bit. That's not to say that physical attraction is not important. Of course it is. But to make that the be-all or end-all or the one category or criteria that you will end up rejecting people for or accepting them for, um, that is very short-sighted. So that's your, now we talked about maliha and jamaliha. Okay, hasabiha, nasabiha. Let's talk about lineage. Of course you want to come from a good family. You want somebody that has... Uh, because that has an impact on how a person is going to approach a relationship. If they come from a broken home and they come from a, you know, they weren't raised well and all of these things, that's, you know, it's not their fault. That's not to blame the person. But it's, your, it's within your right that you would like to just seek somebody who comes from a good family and they're, and they're connected. And at least even if they're not connected, let's say that the, the parents were divorced or whatever. Uh, also, it's not that person's fault. But as long as the parents are maintaining respectful uh, interaction and a respectful relationship, they just really couldn't get along when they were married and they just divorce was the better option. That's fine. Divorce is not haram. It's, it's a per perfectly permissible thing um, that you would have tried to avoid. But if it's just, it's better for them to be separate, that's okay as long as they maintain respect. But, you know, even that, there are many people who come from broken homes, but they're wonderful individuals. They're wonderful human beings. So also to judge a person by that, something that's outside of their control, you know, you can't, لا تزير وزيرة وزيرة أخرى. A soul shall not bear the burden of another soul. So maybe the sister or this brother comes from a home where the family dynamics are not right, you know, they have problems and stuff, but the person themselves, they're an upright individual and they have good character and they look at family in a different way. That's what matters. So that's why the Prophet Sallallahu said, فَذْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ Win over the one that has religion. So 
now when you don't focus on the religion and you focus on all of these material things that everybody seems to focus on or the majority of Muslims seem to focus on now, what you end up with is either many cases of people not getting married until they're much older, uh, which creates another problem, or people getting married for the wrong reasons and then having just terrible relationships because the religious aspect was so minimized, was so sidelined, and everything else was put up on a pedestal, the job, the money, the security, the this, the education, whatever it is that you're, you just place that on such a high pedestal that you just, the religion was not paid attention to, then you end up with bad marriages because now you're material. You're talking about material reasons for getting married. And when you place people, couples, in a, a position where the reason for getting married was a material reason, what you end up with is egos bickering and egos fighting and just one ego trying to overtop another ego. But if both of them had religion on their side and they were both spiritually inclined, what you end up with is a different perspective, a different cosmology. Um, both of them, you know, a couples that pray together, stay together kind of thing. Because for them, this is not about just them. For them, the reason they got married is because they wanted to actualize that from, his, from amongst his signs, from amongst God's signs, is that he has created from amongst you pairs so that you may gain tranquility with one another. And then he placed love between and mercy between each other. Now, if people got married for that reason, you'll have a different story. Now, what happens when uh, the Prophet ﷺ says there will be fitna in the, in the land, there will be this great tribulation and great corruption that will spread all over. What you end up with is human beings are human beings. They have an animal instinct. They have an animal side. And you end up with people engaging in, in questionable relationships that they should not be getting engaged in because they were unable to basically engage in a properly consummated marriage. Let's just call a spade a spade and let's just uh, uh, call it like it is. And I'm sure many listeners um, will feel like this is talking about them. You wanted to get married. Um, you found it difficult. Uh, both of your parents on both sides are not letting you do this. And you had the proper intention that that's what you want. Your relationship drags on. And then you end up in a position where you don't want to be ending up in. And some may end up um, basically engaging in questionable behavior, impermissible behavior. Um, and it's because just as you got used to one another, you know, the, this barrier, this type of respectful barrier that you maintain, this religious barrier that you maintain kind of goes down because you just want to, you know, just get together. And so what ends up happening is facade and fitna. And that's on the, you know, yeah, it's your sin that you're the one engaging in that. But in fact, that's actually the family that's driving the, the, the young people to, into this practice. So my sincere advice to any parents listening to this, you really got to reassess um, what you think is important and what you think really matters. Um, I understand that marriage is a, a difficult decision and it's, uh, you know, it's something that, is, that should be thought about carefully. But at the same time, really reflect on the reasons why you're not letting your uh, young uh, sons and daughters uh, get married when they're supposed to and when they're ready for it. Um, what would be a good Islamic, fa Islam founded and realistic approach to choose a husband in your opinion? I would say that just um, uh, uh, make sure that you have compatibility with regards to education, uh, with regards to, of course, the religious thing, that has to be there. And even with religious stuff, word of advice, um, and this is not to knock on anybody. So I don't want anybody running away from this thinking that this is knocking on one side over the other. If you happen to be more on the Salafi inclination, do not go and pick up somebody who is more on the Sufi orientation side. This is not, you know, or the traditional side, or what they call themselves the orthodox side, or whatever. If you're a Salafi, and it, you attribute yourself, you think like you want to be on the Salafi side, find yourself a Salafi spouse. If you, if you consider yourself more on the spiritual, traditional kind of Sufi side of things, find yourself somebody like that. The reason for this is if you don't agree on religion, and we're not talking about different religions here. We're talking about an approach to the religion. If you have somebody who's a Salafi wanting to marry somebody who happens to be a devout um, Hanafi Naqshabandi, for example, this is, not a, this is a recipe for disaster. And the reason for it is not necessarily about the religion part of it. It's actually about 
um, uh, personal orientation towards and outlook towards how religion is approached. So it's not so much about Sufi versus Salafi, it's just about personality. The personality of somebody who, who inclines towards Salafism, which is a perfectly valid thing to be, I mean, it's fine, I, you know, it's, this is, I'm not knocking Salafism, I'm just saying the personality type of somebody who goes after Salafism does not jive well with the personality type of somebody who's more uh, Sufi inclined, uh, Madhab follower, Ash'ari and Aqeedah, things like that. It's just about a personality. It's not so much about right or wrong. It's just your personalities are not going to get along. So, pick somebody. That's the first thing. It's not just about this person is devout. Devout is not enough. You need the that you ha you need to have that personal kind of trajectory to have a similarity in that. That's not to say that they both have to be at the same level. They don't. People elevate uh, according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them because that's also a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the very least you should have is you should have a similar outlook and approach to the religion itself. This is not to get into debates about bid'ah and this, I'm not interested in innovations. That's not the question here. We're talking about people getting together and getting married. Um, so when it comes to religion, don't just restrict yourself to devoutness. Also ask about orientation. How are they oriented religiously and spiritually? And that will tell you something about their personality. And if you don't meet eye to eye on that, you will never meet eye to eye. The thing is with personality, we can all adapt. We can all, you know, when people get together initially, it's going to have some difficulties because two strangers coming together now and living together. So they're going to have to make adjustments. You can make adjustments, but you will never be able to make changes. Adjustments to personality type is something doable. Changing a personality type, that is impossible. And so that is going to be a recipe for disaster. Um, with regards to behavior and sophistication, I would say the education part is important because you want people that kind of have a similar, you know, um, you don't want somebody, you don't want two people that can't even have a, 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 a dialogue, a conversation where they can understand each other. So I think it's important that two people that are getting together should have similar education levels, at least even at the beginning. Um, if one of them decides to continue on and pursue higher and higher levels of education, at least that person, as they're changing and as they're developing intellectually, those changes and developments will also impact the spouse, even if the spouse is not seeking higher education. But at the start, I would say be compatible in that arena. Have some sort of parity between the two of you. That's not to say that both of you need to have masters or both of you need to have PhDs or whatever. I'm just saying that you need to have a level of education where both of you can understand each other and have a dialogue. Um, um, with regards to behavior, of course, you need to have somebody that you can live with that where the behavior is something that you can um, basically both of you um, um, be able to accept of one another. Um, and then, yeah, after you have all of these things, you consult your heart and consult people around you because the thing is, y you need outside opinion because they might turn your attention to things that you are not aware of. Um, that could be important, but do not make that at the expense of the important things that you already mentioned here, which is your religion, the behavior, the sophistication. And then do your istikhara, and then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees good in it, he will facilitate it for you. And finally, what do you think about proposing to a guy? You be on the path of Khadija radiallahu anha. Now, I'll tell you one thing, though, with regards to Khadija radiallahu anha, because a lot of sisters, I notice that the way that they do it is, and then they say Khadija, and then they do it like, not like Khadija radiallahu anha at all. The way that Khadija radiallahu anha did it was through a media, to, a, a, a mediary. She had somebody go. She asked, first of all, she dealt with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa She saw his behavior. She heard about him. She tried him. Actually tried seeing how he functions and how he acts. That way she confirmed what she heard about his trustworthiness and whatnot. Then she sent for him. She asked around and she had somebody go to him and ask, are you looking to get married? What is it that's stopping you from getting married? What if your concerns about getting married are dealt with? And then Khadija radiallahu was presented as a candidate for him. And he sallallahu alayhi wa said if that's the case and everything is good. And he, he also accepted her character and all of the things that were important. And so that's how they got married. So for the sisters, I'm going to save you a little bit of a heartache. If you're interested in somebody, the first thing you need to do is, first of all, investigate about the big questions. 
How is this person's religion and religious orientation? How is that person's behavior? How is that person's educational level? Once you, once you confirm these things and you ask and you see and this is somebody that you're interested in because initially what, uh, draw do you, what draws you to somebody uh, if you saw them would be just physical attraction but you don't want to base this on physical attraction. Once you confirm all of these things, you confirm the person is single of course, then you have somebody go and investigate and ask on your, not, don't let the person know that you're asking. Just go and have somebody that knows that person, that individual, go ask him and see what's his situation and is he looking. And if he is, then have them make the suggestion of you. And if they're interested, if that person is interested, they'll ask more questions. That's how you'd go about this thing. Um, you don't want to be the person directly going up to the guy and saying, hey, are you looking to get married? And then basically being brushed off or shut off. And then you'll end up with being heartbroken because you had this interest in this person. And to top it off, having some questions about yourself, like, why am I not attractive enough? Am I, am I not good enough? Am I not this or that? You don't want to go through any of that stuff. Because the fact is, maybe the guy is just not interested in getting married right now. Maybe that person is not ready for marriage. Maybe, And there are a lot of guys, by the way, just so you know, we have a lot of guys who are just children and over, uh, who are overgrown children. They're children and grown-up bodies. So a person might look good to you, but once you find out more about them, you realize that, that person is not the right, you know, you don't want to be in that situation, even if they happen to be attractive. So this is, this is the way that you'd want to go about it. Figure out, find out, have somebody kind of uh, deal, a mediator on your behalf that they do not expose you, first of all. They don't tell the person that this is for you. They're just trying to find out where the guy is at. And if the guy is ready for something, then they can propose, I have somebody for you that I think would be good. Would you be interested to know? And if the guy is interested, he'll say, yeah, sure, let me know. And then they'll just, and they'll go and they'll proceed through that. That's how I would go about it. I hope this lengthy answer, Hafsa, answers your question. The next one is anonymous. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. I'm hoping you will be able to help me with a personal dilemma. My husband and I were Muslims by birth, but we did not offer salah. My challenge was laziness and lack of discipline, but I totally knew it was important. Life threw some huge challenges at me, and I started offering salah regularly since last two years, and this has given me lots of spiritual peace and emotional discipline. On the contrary, my husband has not changed. He offers the Eid and weekly Jum'ah prayers, and that's all. Whenever I, uh, whenever I bring up the subject, he gets angry and says I should not be bothered uh, about his iman and akhirah and just take care of my own. I love him and that makes it doubly hard to reconcile with the fact that he doesn't offer salah. I hear some rulings that I should not stay married to him since he is not even a Muslim for not offering salah and I will commit sin by continuing my relationship with him. He fasts Ramadan on all days and gives zakah very diligently. What can I do in this situation? Well, first of all, the opinions that you heard with regards to him being a non-Muslim, you can um, safely uh, shelf them. It is a position by the scholars. Uh, actually, it's a position from uh, one of the positions of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. It's a Hanbali position that uh, simply not offering prayer, regardless what the reason is, if you're just not offering prayer, uh, you're not performing your salah, that takes you outside of the fold of Islam. Um, the majority position of the scholars, however, is, uh, is more nuanced than that. You first have to ask the person, why are they not offering salah? Why are they not praying? And if the reason is they're just lazy, they're just, you know, can't get themselves to do it, but they're not re rejecting the obligation of the prayer itself. And that is the important point. They recognize that prayer is an obligatory part of Islam. It's one of the pillars of the religion and it has to be performed. If they recognize that, but they're just out of laziness, spiritual laziness, whatever, they're not performing it. They're a fasiq, yeah, they're a sinner but they're not outside of the folds of Islam because they have not rejected an essential component of this religion. However, if they don't pray and then they tell you, it's because I actually don't think it's obligatory. Now you're talking about somebody who's left the fold of Islam because now they're just rejecting an essential aspect of it. In your husband's case, what it seems to be just by him going to Jum'ah and praying Eid and at least fasting Ramadan and giving zakat and stuff, it just seems like this, he's just lazy. Even if he doesn't say that he is, he's just lazy. So you're okay in that sense. 
what I would recommend you do is, um, you know, human beings are funny that way. When you tell them to do something, they don't do it. It's just the way that we're put together. It's like kids. You know, even when we're grown up, we act sometimes like kids. Don't do that. And then you go do it. Do that. And then you don't do it. What's better for you is, um, alhamdulillah, he's focused on the good that he, you have right now. He's going to Jumas. He's praying Eid. He's fasting Ramadan. He's paying the zakat diligently, as you say. Very diligently, as you say. So we're talking about somebody who has good in them. It's just a matter of this five daily prayers that he's not doing. I'll tell you a story. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had somebody come to him and um, uh, a Bedouin. And Bedouins are just rough and gruff by nature. And um, he said, yeah, Muhammad, oh, Muhammad, you know, I want to enter this religion, but five daily prayers is too much. I'll give you three. And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, I'll take three. That's fine. And so the guy said, I won't leave it. I'll do it. So he leaves. Now the companions were confused by this and said, what's going on here? How come you accept? We have, not only do we have to pray the five daily prayers, we got to do Qiyamul Layl, we got to do all these things. And this guy just comes in from the desert and just says three prayers and you give it to him. And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was doing that for a reason. This guy was not arrogant. He just felt that it was too much. So he just wanted to just, but he also wanted to be a Muslim. So he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just had him do the three daily prayers. Knowing ahead of time, and that's the firasa of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Knowing ahead of time that this guy, he's gonna start with three, but he's not gonna be satisfied with three. Once he experienced it, what this guy was looking for is to engage in the experience of being a practicing Muslim. The second he engages in that experience, he's not going to be satisfied with three daily prayers, and he will perform the five. So this is the 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 firasa, the insight of the Prophet sallallahu, the beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His insight was so far that he saw that in this man. There was no arrogance in his heart. It was just that he wanted to get into this. When it comes to your husband, I would say also with those who have kids and whatnot, what you want to do is basically demonstrate through action and behavior. You know, the, the human heart is, is interesting that way. The more they observe, the more that this person sees in the home that there is prayer happening at these times, there's Quran recitation taking place. There is dhikr taking place. Their heart, their fitra is not going to sit, it's not going to settle. It's not just going to be sitting still. It is going to move them. And if the more you continue to do that and combine that with you making dua for your husband, sincere dua after your prayers, you know, after every prayer, and especially after your subah prayer, raising your hand and just asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he... Um, uh, basically lifts the veil from your husband's heart and allows him. Because the thing is with prayer, salah, silah, it's about making a connection. A connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, establish this connection for my husband. And do it with sincerity. And the more you practice at home and the more you do these things, he will on his own at some point because he has good in his heart and he's doing these things that these are signs that this person is a good person. They're just needing a little bit of a motivation to do it. And as you notice, the more you talk to him about it, the more angry he gets. So what you're going to have to do is change tactics. And the tactic that I would recommend you do is just continue to do your own practice, continue to do your, and start making dua for him. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide him to engage back again in this process. And it might start off with just one. And what I'd recommend for you is, and just back to the previous question, people have different spiritual levels. Some people are lower than others, and this could happen in the home. The last thing you want to do is have an expectation of your spouse to be at your level, no matter what level you're at. Some spouses want their spouse to come down to their level. Others want their spouse to come up to their level. Don't do that. As long as you are on the same trajectory and your same kind of approach to religion and whatnot, just, you know, once you see your husband maybe starting up to pick up one prayer, say alhamdulillah and just be quiet. Don't tell them, do the next one, and why don't you do the other one? And Because uh, people get excited. They just did one, leave him be. Let him just establish one, and he'll establish second and third, and it will just go on like that. It's interesting times, you know. It's um, uh, The days that we live, they're not really conducive to spiritual development. Anonymous, assalamu alaikum. Uh, wa alaikum assalam. I need, a, uh, I, need a kind, I need a kind of help in my issue. So I'll write a brief... And hope you can give me an advice. Uh, I'm a Middle Eastern woman, and I'm in love with a Western Christian man. 
We're very open to change and discuss, but everyone has his own culture and fears. My question is how to decrease the boundaries, and what's the most right way to open a discussion about converting to Islam as example, or introducing how successful marriage should be in talking to Western man with his free culture and fears of losing his freedom. Please suggest a book, uh, books or articles, uh, or something to help me. Thank you. Um, okay, let's just uh, work backwards. You want a Western person to, uh, if you if you have a desire of you know doing dawah and you want somebody you know call people to Islam and and you want to open up this discussion, I would recommend uh, Charles Guy Eaton's uh, Islam and the Destiny of Man as a starting book uh, to go by. Um, another book is the autobiography of Malcolm X because that has such an impact on people. It's kind of interesting. So, and uh, many people, there are many people, black or white, by the way, who read the autobiography of Malcolm X and end up becoming Muslim. So, autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, Islam and the Destiny of Man by Charles Guy Eaton. These are two important works that I would say you can start off with. Um, then after that, let's just go, um, and articles, there's plenty online. I mean, they can, I, I could recommend andalusonline.org. You can go to Iman Wire as well, and Medina Institute's blog. Um, these are things that they can read and kind of get a perspective um, on what religion is as Muslims believe it um, from a traditional end. So that's with regards to converting. With regards to, uh, you know, what makes a, su a successful marriage? Well, even if the person converts, my recommendation, somebody converts to Islam, you got to wait two years. Over 75% of converts to Islam leave the religion, um, which is scary to think about. And you don't want somebody to convert just for the sake of marriage. So if you want a successful marriage, whoever converts, I would say, even if it's out of pure conviction, Give them a year to two years just to settle down because that initial high that people have uh, of becoming Muslim and this initial excitement and whatnot depends also. It's not just you know, every two years for everybody. Some people maybe have been searching Islam for five to ten years and then they finally convert. That person, yeah, that's fine. They can get married right away to a Muslim woman and it's fine. Or a man to a, or a Muslim man or a convert woman can marry a Muslim man and they'll be fine because they've been searching, researching for a very long time and so their belief is actually more on solid grounds. So you're going to have to judge this based on how long this person has been looking into the religion and also based on the intention that they have with regards to the religion. So that's important. Um, with regards to being in love with a Western Christian man and you're a Muslim woman and, um, you know, this is not just you being in the Middle East, by the way. This applies to many Muslim women in the West who out of maybe just through work or through school, they met somebody, they fell for them. Uh, just a word of advice, people. Um, your infatuation with an individual who you're not married to might make you have very delusional ideas about where this marriage could take you. You know, this culture, it's, and it's, I think it's a byproduct also of this me culture, this narcissistic, narcissistic culture, where you just think about yourself. Marriage is not just about two people coming together. Oftentimes the case, in many cases, marriage also involves families coming together, as well as children in the future coming into the picture. Now, right now, you might think, oh, it's fine, you know, it's, um, we can kind of get along, we can make it work, it's, you know, their belief that... When kids come in, it's actually quite amazing how many people, when children come in, there's like a switch that goes off in their brain and they want to impart their value system onto the children. Now put yourself in a position of somebody who is really just converting for the sake of marriage, but that's it. They're not really interested in the religion at all. And then children come into the equation. Now their value system is going to come into play. And I guarantee you, if they're not solidly grounded, in a value system that you would accept as a Muslim, they're going to push their value system onto the kids. And that is going to be a source of conflict. Don't fall for this initial infatuation period and this, you know, restricted thinking about just, it's just the two of us. There is a lot more going into this marriage than just the two of you. And love is going to go out the window so fast. The second children come in and now you're worried about their hereafter. Believe me, I've seen this happen a lot. So 
this this is one of those things that you need to have, an, and this is another reason why, uh, even for Muslims, you need to have um, uh, an, uh, a harmonious religious orientation between the couple, because the kids come in, and then you have the father who you know wants to go one way, and the mother wants to go another way, and the kids are going to end up in confusion. So, you know, it's love is a difficult thing to tell people to kind of you know. You need, sometimes you might have to step on your heart and just walk away. Um, if this person is not interested in this religion and they're just talking about you, this is not going to be a recipe for anything good in the future. Um, you, you, you really need to make your existence on this planet about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just about any man or any woman. So, and you know, falling in love with a Christian, you know, you can't control love, you can't control, you know, people can meet and they can be infatuated with one another, another and stuff, but honestly, you really got to put a stop to this and you need to get control of your emotions in, a sen in the way that you have to decide what is most important. And um, do, don't ever hang your hopes and your dreams on this person, oh, maybe they will. If they're not already where you need them to be, don't have hopes in the future and don't trust their promises. People will say funny things and people will act and people will pretend and people will do all kinds of things if they're really interested in marrying somebody and getting with them. They will make the most grandiose promises. But if they're not already where you need them to be, it's not going to happen and it's not going to be a good uh, end for you. So you can suggest these books to this guy. Um, if he's showing interest in the religion itself and he really is seeking and he wants to do this, he will be... And that's the other thing. How do you know if he's seeking this or not? Look at how often you're the one bringing up this issue and how often he brings it up. I can tell you from experience, my sister married a convert and um, uh, he, the, w the way that he approached it, he was the one seeking. He was the one wanting to know. He was the one trying to find out. He took the effort. It was obvious that he was the one that he was interested in doing this. And it was not just about marriage. So that's, what, that's how you'll know is if this person is serious or not. If you find yourself always bringing up the topic of religion and the other pa uh, partner is shutting it down, um, kind of uh, coming up with excuses, uh, coming up with reasons not to, uh, coming up with all their fears and doubts about it, then that's not a person you need to be with. And you need to tell yourself that and be okay with and just accept that this is not going to be a situation you want to be uh, involved in. So I hope that helps in some way. It may not be something you wanted to hear, but it's really the truth. Rafay, assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. My faith never gets shaken by watching atheists or ex-Muslim videos or watching atrocities that are happening all around the world. But when I see these quote-unquote Islamists imposing and shunning other people, I just can't bear the skin I'm in and to what monstrosity I'm associated with. I seek your advice on dealing with such peoples. Um, you know, uh, this reminds me of uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali, rahimahullah. This is not the same as Imam al-Ghazali. Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali um, is, an, is an Azhari scholar that passed away in 1996. And uh, he made a very famous statement in which he said, That half of disbelief in the world, the reason for it are so-called religious folk who have ba made God detestable to his uh, creation. So there's nothing more powerful to shake the faith of people than supposed religious types um, who speak in the name of the religion um, and then act out atrocities, atrocities um, behave in ways that are unbecoming, um, what, what have you. So uh, I would say the way that you deal with such people is basically don't subject yourself to them. Don't subject yourself to watching anything that atheists or ex-Muslims or Islamists that you don't like do. You know, you're, you have, take responsibility over what you allow into your heart. And if you want to uh, but trust to build up to fortify your faith you're not doing yourself a favor when you subject yourself to these things personally and I've done this by the way and I have no shame in doing this 
And the last time it happened, it was kind of, it's funny when I think about it now. I had one of those types of people come up to me and after a khutbah I had given, and this person wanted to talk about the hadith that I quoted and, and, and the position and whatever. And so I let him kind of say his piece, like whatever he wanted to say. And then I said, are you done? And he said, yes, I am. And then I said, all right, this conversation is over because I already said my piece in the khutbah and that's where I'm at. And now you have said what you wanted to say and that's where you're at. Assalamu alaikum. And I literally walked away while he was standing there. Some people look at that as rude. and so, But you know what? On a day when nothing will avail you. Money won't avail you. Children won't avail you. No, nobody will come and help you. The only thing that's going to help you is qalbun salim, a sound heart. And I've, over the years, I've developed kind of a, an insight into the type of personalities that I engage with now. And I knew that this person was going to be this type. And it was going to end up into an argument that's not going to be resolved in any way. And it was just going to harm me. Spiritually speaking, so I, just to save myself, I just walk away. I don't subject myself to things like that. And that's what I would say you should do. Rather, go after things that help you build up your faith. Recite your Quran, um, study your sharia, study your, had your fiqh, study your hadith, study the things that matter, listen to the shiyukh and the scholars that you respect, um, and just build up your faith that way. You don't have to, like, I don't, I don't get why people just... You don't need to subject yourself to this. That's really all I got to say to you, Rafi. Ahmed Mustafa, assalamu alaikum, brother. I had a question if you could answer, but I understand if it's uncomfortable or if you don't have the time to answer. One thing that always confuses me is that there are hardly any scholars of Islam who stand up for oppressed Muslims when their oppressors are Muslim governments. I have yet to hear any scholar say anything about the Saudi involvement in the Middle East fitna, no matter what the evidence against them. Or the Qatari involvement and their ongoing involvement. I'm not sure what the Qatari involvement here is talking about, but okay. It's always either Israel or America who are the bad guys when anyone with an iota of common sense can see the bigger problem. Do you know why this is? Uh, do you know why that is? Is it forbidden, forbidding evil only left to the common man to implement? Man, that is a hard one to just offer a short answer for. I've already written articles about this with regards to uh, Muslim scholars and politics and political engagement uh, and Muslim scholars. I believe uh, two episodes ago, I can't remember the number now, but uh, one of the recent uh, episodes, it was within the last five episodes that I recorded this, um, where I talk about uh, the Muslim scholars and their engagement with rulers and tyrannical rulers specifically. And I offered some examples just to show, you know, you really have to, uh, Muslim scholars are human beings as well. And they have fears and they have trepidations. And, and no matter how scholarly they are, you can say, oh, but they should have yaqeen and they should have that. At the end of the day, maybe their decision is not in their hands. Maybe they have somebody, their loved ones are in danger. And you got to remember that. Um, you know, I, I, I had this uh, discussion uh, recently with... Uh, uh, family where they were talking about how come Muslim scholars don't speak out same type of question and I said or how come they might even speak in favor of one of these Muslim governments I was like alright if I'm in this position and I'm not saying I'm a scholar I'm just saying if I'm in that position and uh, let's say that it's just about me I'm the only one who might be harmed if I say anything yeah I'll speak up I'll say things I'll, I'll speak against uh, the corruption I'll say all the but the thing is, these Muslim governments, the way that they function is they don't go after you. They go after your family. So my response was, if, if I get a phone call from the internal, uh, from like the secret services or the uh, CIA or whoever, you know, it's like the, the Muslim version of these things, the police, the torture police, whatever, and I get a phone call and I find out that my mother and my father are in custody and the only way for me to save them is to speak in favor of one of these governments. You know what? Don't be surprised if I go up and I start praising these people because it's no longer about me. You know, unless, unless I know that my parents will put up and they will disown me. You know, there is a beautiful scene in this uh, Paisha Abdul Hamid, this Turkish series about Sultan Abdul Hamid II. There was a uh, 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 one episode, there's one scene where the assistant of Sultan Abdul Hamid was um, uh, being accused of uh, uh, just a 
the British government at the time and their games that they were trying to do with the Ottoman uh, government and whatnot. And so they brought this guy's, the assistant's mother, into the courtroom. And basically they wanted him to speak against Sultan Abdul Hamid to incriminate Sultan Abdul Hamid. So his mother said, the milk that I fed you when you were little is impermissible for you if you harm Sultan Abdul Hamid and our country. So that is a situation in which the assistant, he, it looked like he was going to succumb at a moment of weakness and his mother, who was being held hostage by the enemies, tells him, do not succumb to your weakness. So now she gave him the okay to go on in the way, in the path that he was going on. So that's kind of the thing that you have to realize. Many people don't have these conversations with their families. They don't know where their family stands. And so now you're going to be put in a position where you might have to make a decision that's not going to harm you, but it might harm your loved ones. So you're, ta you're dealing with human beings. They're not, the scholars are not angels. Um, you know, we can talk about the yaqeen and certainty and all of these things till the cows come home until we're blue in the face. But you know what? Human emotion is human emotion. For many people, for most people, if they have their children taken hostage, they have their parents taken over, they have their sisters and brothers potentially getting uh, violated by torture and all of these things by the state, and the only thing that would save them is you speaking in favor of or at least being silent so that you don't put any of your family members in harm's way, don't be surprised why these scholars are not being, you know, they're not speaking up. That's just one excuse. You know, that just to think about like, oh, think of all the different reasons why a scholar would say something in favor of a government or why a scholar would not say anything. The fact is, you don't know the context and what that scholar is involved in and what it would entail if he spoke up and what it would mean. And we just don't know. So, you know, I know it's hard for a lot of people to accept this. But I've been around enough, alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to be around enough teachers and enough scholars and to gain an insight into the back end of things. You know, we all get to see what gets curated for us through the news media and through social media. And then we form very strong, staunch opinions about it. But then when you go and talk to the scholars and find out in the, you know, behind the scenes what's happening, you start to feel a little bit of shame, actually, for having judged these people. So... Yeah, are there people that are genuinely bad and scholars who are just, you know, for the sultan and they're just after their own gains and stuff? Yeah, there are. But know something. These are the minority. The, major the majority of scholars are not like that. So why do we have this situation? What you'll find a lot of scholars doing instead of speaking against the government, um, which is actually uh, something that has insight. The Prophet ﷺ, there's a hadith, it's weak, but... It's it actually is supported by a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Like so, we place oppressors over other oppressors because of what they have been earning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that. And then, because that's the sunnah of the world, that's how the world is functioning. And the hadith, which is weak, but it's supported by this verse, the Prophet is reported to have said, or allegedly it was reported to have said, as you are, you will have rulers placed over you. So a lot of scholars, what you'll find is they'll follow almost like a Ghazalian approach. Imam al-Ghazali was criticized for, uh, during his time, the Crusades were happening and Jerusalem had fallen. Yet you don't find Imam al-Ghazali, despite having visited Bayt al-Maqdis, despite knowing that it was under the control of the Crusaders, you don't find Imam al-Ghazali in his writings talking anything about Jerusalem and about, hey, everybody get up and, and arm up and so that we can go and bring back Jerusalem. You don't find anything like that. Now, Imam al-Ghazali, uh, in his defense, scholars that have written in his defense why he wouldn't speak up against it, have said one of the reasons was there were many scholars speaking against it and it did not serve anybody any good. Um, it did not create change. And the more important reason why it would have just been futile for him to say anything is because he spent his time looking and trying to deal at the root cause of why Jerusalem fell. And the root cause had to do with the scholars that were present at the time and the people and the way that they approached their religion and how the religion has become basically rituals and no heart to it and there's no spirit to it and it was not refining the souls anymore and everybody was basically going after material things. And so he wrote Ulum al -Din, the revival of the Islamic sciences or the religious sciences. And in it, he basically highlights all of the ailments and all of the treatments and the cures of the heart and the character and to basically revive 
the Islamic um, uh, ethos within the Muslim community. Lo and behold, not too long after, you have Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, and in his biography, it said that aside from the Quran, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi had Ihya Ulum al with him in all of his travels, the Ghazali text. So you see Salah al-Din, the, this great commander, going into Jerusalem, and you find stories of, oh my God, when he went to Jerusalem, he forgave these people, he uh, kept them, he, he uh, allowed them to practice, to do their thing, there was peace and harmony, he was just, all that was actually... And a, uh, a product of the refinement that the Ihya had on him. So a lot of Muslim scholars now, when they're dealing with the Muslim community, you can either, it's almost like trying to treat cancer. You can either try to direct your treatment at removing the cancer itself, or just give people drugs to sustain or to uh, basically keep the symptoms at bay, but without treating the underlying disease that's causing all of these symptoms. So when it comes to, okay, the rulers that we have and the governments that we have, that is a symptom. That's not the root cause of the disease. That is a symptom. The root cause of the disease, and this is a theory in social uh, sciences uh, that says basically the government is just a, a macrocosm uh, of the microcosm. It's a macrocosmic realization or actualization of what happens at the microcosm. And the microcosm is the home, the family, how families are run. And so I would invite each one of us to just reflect on our own interactions in the home, our own interactions with uh, our friends, our own interactions with how we do our work, how we perform, uh, our own trustworthiness, how we conduct ourselves. And the more you reflect on this, you'll start to feel a little bit embarrassed with regards to like, okay, so that makes sense why we have the rulers that we have. They're just a reflection of us. The governments, the Muslim governments are a reflection of Muslim community. And you want to go a little bit more than the family? Just look at how masjid boards are run. You know, look at how all the drama that happens in the masjid, in the Western community at least. And you'll see, like, it's, like this is not an accident, guys. So to blame the scholars for, oh, they're not speaking up. The scholars are trying to treat the, the underlying disease, which is we need to fix the Muslim community. And so a lot of their efforts right now are being directed at let's fix our hearts, let's fix our situation, because once we fix that, then the bigger problem will be fixed on its own. Um, so that's kind of what I'd have to say for you, Ahmed. There is more to say about this. I'm just trying to keep these brief so that I can continue on with answering the questions. But if you want more, you can go to endlessonline.org. I've written articles on this, and I've also recorded podcasts on this, so just go back through the past episodes, and you can listen to the relevant uh, material there. Rami Salah. Salam, Brother Muhammad. I just watched your video on Sufism, and it was very useful in helping me learn about Sufism, which I've only recently developed an interest for. I'm interested in learning about Tasawwuf, but don't know where to begin. I'm a revert and can never, uh, and can never had, I never had, um, a basic education in Islamic studies. Most of what I learned about Islam came from listening to scholars on YouTube. I'm currently undergoing an MSc in occupational therapy and hope to pursue a degree in Islamic studies when I finish, inshallah. However, I'm also interested in finding out more about and maybe even studying tasawwuf. If there are any good books you can recommend to help me get started, I would really appreciate it. Jazakallah khair. Um, well, tasawwuf is, um, uh, it's really the science of about purification of the heart. So I would highly recommend you pick up Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's text, uh, translation uh, uh, and commentary, uh, The Purification of the Heart, Matarat al Um it's, it's a wonderful text, and I think it will help you understand a lot of what tasawwuf is really about. Um, so that's just a start. Um, another one you can pick up is, there, it's been translated, uh, Imam al-Ghazali's Bidayatul Hidayah, um, the beginning of guidance. So that's an important one. But more important than all of this, Rami, do not make your primary education of Islam YouTube. I don't know where you live, you, di you didn't indicate, but um, I would highly recommend you start seeking out and searching uh, to find a teacher in your locality, a traditional Muslim teacher, someone who can teach you one of the schools of law properly, whether it's Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, I don't care, but you need to study one of the schools, and you need to, to have that presence, and you need to study with a teacher. You need a physical presence uh, for that to actually start impacting your heart. It's not going to be enough for you to just 
um, uh, you know, watch some YouTube videos and, um, and just read books. You need the presence of teachers. So I highly recommend that you, um, and I urge you to, um, to go and find a teacher and start to establish that relationship. And um, depending on where you are, you know, you can look online and just find out, you know, even if the teachers that you listen to, just find out where they reside. And if they're close to you, try to get a hold of them. Try to go to programs, uh, retreats, uh, you know, rihlas, things like that, where you can go for a week, two weeks, three weeks, where you can sit in the presence of teachers and actually experience what that's like. You will have openings like you've never had before. Nothing on YouTube and no book you can ever read is going to impact your heart in the same way that sitting with people like, you know, the shiyukh can. So, I'd, you know, you're talking about waratatul anbiya, the inheritors of the prophets. So you need to sit with teachers. Next question is anonymous. Assalamu alaikum again. Hope you're doing fine, Ustad. Alhamdulillah, I am now. I have another question if you don't, if you don't mind. So I've been working on my health for years. And lately I've been feeling discouraged to continue thinking that all this daily muraja and new surahs are just getting too hard and time consuming. Whenever the thought comes, how do I know if it's my brain or it's a whispering from outside? How to discern that? Honestly, it would feel better to know if, if it's from outside, in which case you can just say it's isti'adha and take it as a struggle. But what if it's your intellect and you're actually about to make a reasonable choice? I'm confused. Please help. Um, it's not it's not shaitan. It's if it's the way that you know if it's outside or inside. And when we say outside, we're talking about whisperings from shaitan. When we say inside, we're talking about whispering from the nafs, from the ego. It's not the intellect. It's the ego. The nafs is adal adi. It's the greatest enemy that you'll have. It's not shaitan. Your lower base, base desires, your ego, that is going to be your biggest enemy that you're going to contend with. Like the hadith says, when the Prophet ﷺ was coming with companions from a battle, we have come back from the lesser jihad, from the lesser struggle, to the greater jihad, al jihad al akbar. Um, and that is basically struggling with yourself because the lesser one, battle, you know, you're facing an enemy, it's short lived. Um, and you just finish it and you're done. You can either, you know, be a martyr in that battle or you can come back home and it's over. It's a, it's, it's a limited thing. But the jihad of the nafs, the struggle with the self and the ego, this is ongoing until you pass away. The way that you know the difference between shaitan and ego, shaitan comes to you with different things. So shaitan will come and say, look, do this. And if you don't do it, he doesn't waste his time. He'll try another thing. The nafs, on the other hand, will persist and will just stick with one thing. And will just try to nag on you all the time. So what you need to do here is basically recognize that this is your nafs. And you need an external... Um, so when it comes to your hifd for your muraja'ah, my recommendation is that you need to have that kind of a, a time block that is not too overwhelming. And um, you just limit yourself to that time block. Whatever it is. It could be as little as 15 minutes. But let's say that you review and memorize uh, over a half an hour period. Just block that time off, set a timer, and just tell yourself, we're just going to sit for half an hour, we're just going to do this. There are going to be days where you're going to struggle and you're going to feel like, I don't want to do this. You have to let yourself know that this is happening. Come hell or high water, we're doing this. It's almost like talking to yourself, because that's really what you're going to end up having to do. Talk to yourself and let yourself know that there is no negotiation when it comes to doing this hifth. We're doing it. And so set a timer and, um, and have that blocked off and have that on a schedule. I can't, rec I can't stress highly enough how important it is to have a proper schedule set in place that you know when things are going to be done. Once you don't have a schedule and things are just kind of floating up in the air, you actually give your ego, your nafs, more ammunition because it hasn't been set in stone and you need to set it in stone. Um, but yeah, say your sti'ala and just continue. And just know that you're going to have ups and downs. You're just going through a down period right now. There's going to come a period when you're going to feel a little bit high, which is good. Take advantage of it. And then when you come back down, make sure that you have a minimal uh, level that you go down to. So let's say that your minimum level that you'll go down to is 15 minutes and you will not go any less than that. On the days you're feeling down, just do 15 minutes. On the days that you're feeling really high, half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever the case may be, take advantage of it, you know, and then go on from there. And don't be too troubled by the ups and downs too much. Ups and downs are a, nor a normal, natural, cyclical thing that happens to, to spirituality. Uh, Norristown Islamic Society. We received below a request in our masjid email. 
uh, would you please help us to direct, uh, uh, help us direct the requester with some comment of yours, but more importantly, with work from other Muslim scholars? Please assist. All right, so here's a question. According to my understanding, which may be ill-informed of Islam, Allah has the power to change his own will. Okay, that's ill-informed. Um, however, Christians believe in and have argued strongly for the immutability of God. So do Muslims. Uh, he is the unchanging changer, according to Christians. Uh, how, Muslims, how would Muslims respond to the argument that God is changeless? We wouldn't. We say that. Uh, for example, the Christian philosopher Edward Fesser has written five proofs for the existence of God, wherein he argues for the immutability, changelessness of the Creator. I can guarantee you that this actually came from a Muslim source and he's just recreating it. Can the Creator change his own will? If you know of any good books on Muslim metaphysics, that would enlighten me. Feel free to tell me about them, but they have to be free or cheap. Sincerely, Mike. Um, well, Mike, uh, I can tell you that what you're saying is ill-informed with regards to Allah changing his own will. That doesn't happen. Um, and when you speak about change, you're actually speaking about a temporal relationship where there is time and space taking place uh, as part of the dimension and from an Islamic belief. Um, that is not sensible. That is not wise. That is not the way that, uh, that is not true. Um, God is beyond space and time. He's changeless. Uh, these concepts do not apply to God. So that's kind of where we stand. If you're looking for resources that are free or cheap, I would say go to Seekers Hub dot, uh, is it org now? Seekers Hub. Just search on Google Seekers Hub, uh, Sheikh Faraz Rabbani and the team over there. You can actually take a free course on Islamic theology. And if you want to learn about what Muslims believe and what the Islamic belief is about God and all of these things, I would highly recommend you uh, just uh, take the course. They will give you material. You will have free material to read. Um, you'll be able to go through the course for free at your own pace. Um, and so you'll learn something from that. The other option I would recommend is uh, listen to the series that I put out, Deliverance from Error. Um, you'll find that series, just search Muhammad Ghailan, Deliverance from Error, and that will come up on YouTube. There is this list there, or on SoundCloud, there is a playlist there. And that's where I also discuss metaphysics and Islamic theology. So that might help you out a little bit. And I do, I do talk about books and stuff there. Shah Fuhayt. Assalamu alaikum. May Allah bless you and you as well. If I, can take your, uh, if I can take your moment so that you could give a career advice, I would be highly grateful. I want to study classical Islamic science to serve myself and my community. I have done my bachelor's in engineering. Should I pursue my interest in Islamic scholarship now? Or should I pursue a master's in engineering to secure my career and then delve in Islamic sciences or do part-time Islamic courses? Also, to which place can I go and study Islam? Regards, Shah Fuhayt. Um, I would say set yourself up so that you're you are financially independent. You do not want to be a burden on anybody. So if that requires you going and getting a master's in, in engineering, then go ahead and do that. With regards to Islamic sciences, I'll just tell you the same counsel that I got from Imam Zaid Shakir. This is not something that you gain through a bachelor program or a degree program. The study of the, the seeking of sacred knowledge and the study of Islamic of the Islamic tradition is a lifelong journey where you connect with teachers, you can travel sometimes, but you should always have a teacher that you can go back to, and you study traditional texts, and you continue to do this until the day you die. So where do you need to go? I would say find a local teacher, traditional local teacher, who you can commit to, let's say, once a week. And you go once a week with your text and you start off with basic studies and just go through it with them while you go through your Masters of Engineering or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and before you know it, you'll find yourself have advanced to such a degree that it's, it's going to surprise you. So that's what I'd say you need to do. Become financially independent. Islamic studies is, and Islamic sciences is not something that you do um, uh, in some degree program and then pretend that you're a scholar afterwards. Shihab Khan, Assalamu alaikum brother. There is this question which has been pla uh, plaguing my mind. I don't seem to be able to find an answer to it. Um, in the regular basis of affairs, when it comes to politics, society, and work, we try to be 
as rational as possible. We demand that people supply us the facts and based on that we find rational conclusions. If someone asks us to believe something, we ask for quote-unquote proof. It is a reasonable and necessary proposition, I suppose. However, when it comes to belief in God, especially a personal and particular God as Allah, the Quran doesn't talk about proofs. Nowhere, to the best of my uh, knowledge, does Allah say that such and such thing is the proof that Islam is the true way of life, that Allah is the true, uh, is the true God, etc. What Allah mentions in this world, um, what Allah mentions is, is, is this world, uh, this Quran, and everything else is, in the, uh, is an ayah of Allah, i.e. a sign of Allah. A sign is something that doesn't pr itself prove anything, but it points towards a particular and plausible conclusion. My questions to you are, is it only possible to reach Allah through intuition rather than, di than direct proofs? What do we as a species li uh, living in the 21st century lack that we cannot see Allah in his creation? Why do the teleological arguments for God and Allah fall, uh, fail to convince the majority of presumably learned, thinking, and rational people, while the Qur'an is replete with them? Is there any missing ingredient in our thinking process without which we cannot reach Allah? Um, is building up a burning conv a conviction about something solely based on intuition and indirect ayahs justified? Um, well, first of all, when it comes to rational proofs, the Quran does use rational proofs. When it talks about uh, if you had two gods, it would have been destroyed. And then you look at the tafsir of what that's talking about, that you have two supreme beings that are having their own free will. At some point, they will clash, and you just would not have a universe the way that you have a universe. But I get your point with regards to what you're trying to ask here with regards to rational proofs. You're looking for like syllogisms. Like deductive proofs, like what Aristotle would do, you know, uh, something like, uh, you know, every Socrates, uh, every man will die, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates will die, kind of thing. And that's kind of what you're looking for. The thing with this, when it comes to the Islamic tradition, you cannot limit, you know, because that, that restricts the vast mercy of Allah. You can't limit the ways of arriving at certainty to one way or another. Some people arrive at it through their fitrah. They just know it. They don't need any proofs for it. Other people require proofs. Most people, on the other hand, from what I gather, not, they need proofs, and at the same time, they also need to have uh, experience. And that's where they get certainty. So, is it only possible to reach Allah through intuition rather than direct proofs? Yes, it is possible. Why do we... Because that's the fitrah of the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created... The thing is... Uh, in Surah Al-A'raf when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, to all of us in Alam Al-Dhar uh, that he, didn't, didn't I ask you alastu bi rabbikum qalu bala shahidna that did I not ask you now to confirm that I am your Lord and the the souls before they entered into this world and into their bodies they said bala shahidna so there is this it's part of our soul, this knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something that's within the heart. And ev as soon as we arrive to this world, it's like Rumi says, that I know one thing for certain is that I'm not from this world and I intend on going back to where I came from. So that's somebody that's actually in touch with their inner being. Um, so that's, that you can do that. Uh, rational proofs are also there for a certain segment of the population. They don't work for everybody, but for many people they might be necessary. So... You can reach it either way, but for many people, it's it's a two-action thing. You need to have the rational proofs, and then you engage in the practice, and then both of them coming together produces this final certainty that you have. Um, why do, uh, uh, let's see, uh, what do we as a species living in the 21st century lack? We cannot see in Allah and His creation. We don't lack anything. We actually have too much. Uh, we talked about this in, a, in the webinar of Technopoly, last year at Andalus Book Club, and uh, we're going to discuss this again and amusing ourselves to death. We have such so much technology. We have so many different distractions that we actually don't see, uh, don't see the creation. Forget about seeing Allah's work in the creation. We're not seeing the creation. Most people listening to this podcast right now, if you ask them, when was the last time you actually saw the Milky Way galaxy? When was the last time you saw a clear night sky with so many stars 
that the galaxy is there and you can see all the different constellations. Light pollution has basically prevented us from seeing all of these things. Um, the way that our cities are constructed, they're so artificial. So we don't actually see Allah's creation as we should, which produces this kind of ambivalence towards it and produces this exaltation of technology because we see and we use it so much. So we're lacking our connection with nature. That's why we're not seeing Allah's work in the creation. Why do the teleological arguments for God and Allah fail to convince the majority of presumably learned thinking and rational people while the Quran is replete with them? Um, is there any missing ingredient in our thinking process without which we cannot reach them? And uh, is building of a burning convic conviction about something solely based on intuition and indirect analysis justified? So I said that's justified, but I would say that with regards to why so many so-called intellectual, rational people don't accept um, uh, the uh, that the proofs that we might have and 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 uh, the theological arguments that we have, why don't they accept them? It's because you live in the inherited intellectual tradition of the Enlightenment period, which rejects teleology. It rejects rationalism for empiricism. Um, and so you're basically just seeing the byproduct of that. There is this kind of uh, a, a cognitive inclination on the part of the atheists today that makes them actually come up with very absurd questions and believe in the absurd. The absurd proposition that something can come out of nothing. And that something is the thing that brought itself out of nothing. But it existed before to bring itself into existence. It's just nonsensical phrases and nonsensical statements. Um, and that's just a cognitive inclination that has been engendered into the mind from a very young age. I remember my youngest sister when she was still in elementary school and in middle school, when she started to get science books, I like to go through the introduction. Because in the introduction, you'll see the philosophy of that author. Um, and so a lot of school now, basically what it does is it, um, uh, it, it, it molds the mind in a way to think uh, through an empiricist lens where rationalism and teleology and all of these things, they don't actually make sense to it. They don't, they don't comprehend it right away. Even in, they could be the smartest people out there. They just don't comprehend it. And because they've ad adopted in a very aggressive way an empiricist philosophy, um, they've also accepted some absurdities that go along with it, um, which makes you question their intelligence, really, if you ask me. So why, why don't they get it? It's because of the way that they've been educated. It's a habit of the mind now. Hamza Mahmoud, Assalamu Alaikum. Hope you are in the best state of Iman and health. I have listened to some of your material on YouTube. I'd come across on your video named as, uh, as Agnostic Muslim, in which you explain the spiritual journey from Imam Ghazali, how he find Islam was the truth. But the problem with the spiritual journey is that people from every part of the world, from different cultural experience, uh, uh, their religion as truth. How can we know which experience is truth? The only way for you to know which experience is truth is to know that it is rooted in a true th uh, theology. If the theology that it's rooted on is batil, then there is a good chance that what they're having is not a spiritual experience. They're just having an experience. All right. We're almost there, guys. Two more questions. Anonymous. Is it foolish to think about moving back home, i.e. Pakistan, to work for the country? I have wrestled with these thoughts ever since I moved to Canada with my family uh, 10 years ago. I was in high school then, now completing my master's and thinking of going to med school. Every time I see someone leaving the country, I go back and reevaluate my thoughts. I'd love to go back and work uh, there, but then I think about the, com uh, the comforts here and everything that's happening there. Uh, it all collapsed, uh, but, oh, okay. what, what, but when I think, not then I think, but when I think, about the comforts here and everything that's happening there, it all collapses. It might be important to know here that all my relatives are back home. Since you don't know much about the situation, a generalized answer would work. Jazakallah khair. Um, well, I could tell you that just about all my relatives live in Sudan, and we're in Canada, and now I'm in Australia. We're now literally, I only have one relative in Australia now. And the rest of my relatives, direct family, are all in Canada. And indirect family, just about all of them are in Sudan, with a few in Yemen, a few in Saudi Arabia, but majority are in Sudan. So not once did I consider, like, oh, i got to go back and work for the country and do these things. 
there is an advice that I, uh, I've been given by one of the shiuch and I'm going to give it to you. أقم نفسك في ما أقامك الله فيه. Establish yourself in wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the doors of uh, education, of career, of sustenance, of whatever, He keeps opening doors for you where you're at right now, you would be closing the door and then running after something else which has a door that hasn't really been opened for you yet. If it's ever going to open, that is. And if it's not open you're going to struggle as you try to open a door that was not meant to be opened. So I would say it's best that, and especially with, you're already saying it in the way that you're writing this, you know, with regards to the comforts there and what you, like, you're going to have a hard time, especially after 10 years now living in Canada. You've gotten used to it. I can tell you, I, my limit, my time limit in, the, in an Arab country now is two weeks. Three weeks is pushing it. I can't last longer than that. And that's just because of cultural reasons, communication reasons, you know. I just can't do it. What I'm expecting and what, how I'm expected to, how, what I'm expecting with regards to uh, experience and treatment and comforts and whatever the case may be that I have, I just don't receive it uh, when I'm there. And so I can't, I can't see myself living there. And my limit is just two weeks and I'm out. So even though I have this affection this emotional attachment. You know, I do think about it to this day, like, oh man, it would be really nice to go back, you know, and just do something in Sudan to help the people and stuff. You know what? I can do that still. I don't have to go live there, but I can try to work around this desire of mine and figure a way to make it happen without closing doors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening for me. Um, just remember, there's always more than one way to help. And don't ever think that your help necessitates necessitates your presence or your direct involvement in something. Oftentimes, it might be better. And even now that after 10 years, there were cultural developments and, and things that changed back in Pakistan that even if you were going back to visit uh, on the summer, you still wouldn't pick up. You've now been molded in a different uh, country and a different culture. And you basically grew up. You came in high school. You kind of grew, grew up now, part of your childhood, and you've adopted things that are just not present in Pakistan. So it might actually be more helpful for you to get uh, through your connections and your relatives in Pakistan that you want to do something is to with ones who you have a closer relationship with and you trust and you want them to and they're interested in this work is for you to say hey I want to do this I need your help and then maybe if you if your presence is needed at certain times you can make a trip have your presence uh, you know do its uh, service function do whatever you need to do and then you go back to where you're established aqim nafsaka fima aqamak Allahu fi a lot of people just close doors out of desires of running after these things, thinking that they're going to change the world. But in fact, they're just closing doors upon themselves. And because they're closing doors, now they're losing the means to change the world the way that it needs to be changed. Alhamdulillah. So finally, we're coming to the last question. Just for those of you, know the two of you who have stuck with me all the way through. Barakallahu feekum. Abdullah, I'm a 22-year-old Canadian. I've been struggling with some doubts, and I really hope you can help me clear my doubts so that I may regain my certainty in Islam. Once again, I want, as, once again, as I want Islam to be true, I have some questions which I hope you can answer, and I will order them for most troublesome to least troubling. May God bless you and guide us all. Ameen. I saw your video on YouTube about how can a merciful God send people to hell and you explained this concept very beautifully from Imam al-Ghazali. However, the issue that I have, the issue that I'm having a tough time grappling with this concept is the part of eternal hell for a disbeliever. How can we wholeheartedly say with full conviction that Allah is most merciful, 70 times more, times more merciful to us than our own mothers? Yet, he actively chooses to send a disbeliever to hell for all of eternity just to not just for not believing in him even if the disbeliever is a good person i agree that they should be punished for their crime but their crime was for a finite time so how can they be punished infinitely for a maximum lifespan of 60 to 70 or even 100 years also why would allah make their deeds worthless as mentioned in the quran isn't that unjust i mean is the crime of disbelief really that bad that Allah wouldn't mind torturing a disbeliever for all of eternity? 
The analogy I would like to give you is that of a child and his parents. If the parents took care of the child and gave him everything that the child could ever could have ever wanted in life, and the child decides to disown his parents and consider someone else as his family, uh, although his parents would be deeply saddened and even angered by this, I highly doubt that they would want to throw their own child in a burning pit of fire for all of eternity and give him new fresh skins after roasting his skin so that he feels the punishment for disowning them. I mean, as a limited human being, I feel I can come up with a more merciful solution to deal with a disbeliever than this. For example, God could simply destroy them after a period of time for their crime in hell, then destroy them or then, uh, or then cause the destruction upon them after their reckoning on a day of judgment. But again, how is it that I'm, limited, I'm a limited human being, yet I'm able to come up with a more merciful solution? Please help me reconcile this, because the thought of eternal hell is very uncomfortable for me, and I can't seem to reconcile this with the justice, because the crime is finite, yet the punishment is infinite. Thank you. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. This is going to be a good one to finish off with. First of all, um, with regards to uh, the uh, the beginning part of this question was um, uh, that Allah chooses, yet He chooses to send a disbeliever to hell for all eternity just not just for not believing in Him. Um, there is a problem with this because Allah is not the one choosing to send the disbeliever to hell for all of eternity. It's the disbeliever making that choice. And we're talking here, if you remember from the video, we're talking about the third type of disbeliever. We're talking about somebody who received the message, understood the message, recognized the truth of the message, and then out of their own arrogance, and they knew the consequences, by the way, of not accepting the message. So we're not talking about somebody who's a good person, who just you know hasn't really received. We're not talking about... I honestly, I think the majority of people in our day and age, um, I, I I can't see this applying to them because if you ask, I've asked so many people, and I've alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to travel around and to to speak to so many people, and I'm in a position where I get exposure to a lot of different forms of thought and questions and things. The majority of non-Muslims don't actually understand what Islam is. The propaganda machine and the misinformation combined with what I mentioned earlier in the podcast here with regards to, Imam, uh, to Sheikh Al-Ghazali's statement that half of disbelief is caused by believers, people who are attributed to the religion, who made God detestable to his creation. So you have people who basically drive people away from God. There's so much going on. Um, it, it makes it very difficult for me to see. Um, and again, judgment is for Allah alone. But you know, based on the Quran, based on the scholarly breakdown of this, most people today would fall under the category of they're non-Muslim, but they're not going to be judged based on the criteria of rejecting Islam out of arrogance because the Islam that they were introduced to was not, you know, the message that they got was completely distorted. And it was basically bastardized in a way that drives them away from it. So in fact, they're just following their fitrah. And so their judgment is going to be different. We're talking here about when it comes to hell, Somebody who received the message, understood the message, recognizes the truth of the message, but out of their own arrogance and knows what the consequences are of rejecting the message, but out of their own arrogance decide that I don't want this still. I still don't want it. And you might ask yourself, well, how come? How can someone know the truth of something and still reject it despite the consequences? Look at your own relationships. How often did you know that what your parents told you or what your spouse said to you was true and you knew you were in the wrong, but you got arrogant, you got hot-headed, and you continued on your path. And then you suffered some consequences for it, whatever these consequences might be. That example should tell you that you have the capacity to be presented with truth and to know that it's true and to know that you're in the wrong and to still continue upon your way, knowing full well what the consequences are going to be. The first one to do that was Iblis, Shaitan. He was commanded to prostrate in front of Adam alayhi salam. He rejected the command. And the interesting thing, it's not like he rejected it from through an intermediary, like with, through a messenger. He directly, like, Allah. This is who he rejected. So just to show you what kind of the level of arrogance that is potentially possible by a creature. 
So this is perfectly reasonable to us to expect of human beings to do, to see the truth. And just pride and arrogance, you know. Oftentimes we, we, we make a mistake. How, how many of you, you know, and I'll call myself out, you know, in this, but I try as best as I can when I do recognize this, I try to just break that ego and just say, if you made a mistake, just admit to it. Recognize the mistake, admit the mistake, seek, you know, forgiveness, ask, you know, make tawbah, whatever the case may be. But you just know that I'm not just not going to, this is wrong and I did wrong and I'm, I'm going to own it and then I'm going to move on. I'm going to learn from it and I'm not going to repeat it again. That's what tawbah is. But how often do we, facing uh, a situation where our pride and arrogance gets the best of us and we just decide to just, you know, elevate up and just say, nope, I'm not going to do it. So... This is this is a possibility that you could be presented with a message, know that it all makes sense, and recognize that it's true, but because it might cramp your style, it might just you know the idea of prostrating and bowing, the idea of being part of the Muslim community, even, you know whatever the case may be, that you end up just being arrogant about it, and it doesn't have to be haughty like antagonistic arrogance, by the way. It could just be the fear of loss of your wealth, fear of loss of your family, fear of loss of whatever. So despite you recognizing the truth and the consequences of w rejecting this truth, because of worldly things, you decide that, no, I'm just going to pursue the worldly things. So that's what, who, that's all the ayat, all the verses in the Quran that talk about hell and the punishment in hell, this is who it's talking about. This is the type of individual that goes into that. Now, the choice is not Allah's choice here. Allah granted us free will. So towards the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It's such an interesting verse that we have given the trust, we have offered the trust to the heavens, to the earth, to the mountains, so grandiose things in the creation. And they all rejected it. They all said, nope, don't want it this trust, which the scholars say it's talking about free will, the ability to choose right from wrong, the ability to choose to obey or disobey. Everything in creation rejected the offer, except for the human being. The human being said, I'm going to take it. I got this. And then the verse ends with, إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا jahula." That certainly this human being is oppressive, i.e. against him or herself, jahula, and also ignorant. So in order for this free will to really have its, to, to really have an, uh, uh, to, to be meaningful, you also have to have consequences. You can't just say Allah is merciful and out of his love. So the, the concept that you're addressing here, Abdullah, that, that, that you're bringing in is a bit of a Christian concept that Allah is all loving. You're not talking about Allah all merciful. You're talking about Allah is all loving. We don't have that concept in Islam. Allah is al-wadud, yes, he has love for you, and that's why he brought you into create into into the existence. But that does not mean that he's attached to you emotionally. Note that when you, as a and even you recognize, you're talking as a human being, with a limited sense of justice and mercy, or whatever. You're projecting your human qualities onto the divine. This is what's called anthropomorphism. And you recognize that you're doing that. So you have to recognize also that you should not be doing that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond all of this. So it's not that Allah is choosing to throw you into hell, you know, to, to, to this believer in hell, or billah. It's that that disbeliever was offered something and made a choice. Now, you brought up this issue of justice. Note that in your question, you came with a ready-made sense of what justice is. The crime should fit the the punishment should fit the crime, and then you made an equation that this crime, you know, if it goes on for this long, and so you made a judgment after that, if it goes on for seventy years, therefore the punishment should go for seventy years. You are now projecting your perception or your conception of the weightiness of the crime. The crime here that we're talking about is rejection of Allah. And when you reject Allah and you go with your own arrogance and stuff. The way the Quran uh, describes that is أَرَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَى That, um, uh, who, do you see the one who مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَى أَرَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَى Do you not see the one, Surah so Al-Jathiyah, do you not see the one who takes their 
own God as their own ego, their own whims and desires. And that's why in the Quran there is no talk of atheism. The Quran does not recognize atheism as such. There is no such thing as no God. It, there is such a thing as what type of God are you talking about? So the atheist is not really an atheist in the true sense of the word because Quranically speaking, this is someone who's, who are they obeying? Their whims and desires. So Quranically, using Quranic language, so then that's your God. That is your transcendent source of uh, commandments and prohibitions. Your whims and desires. So that's your God. That is a type of shirk. It's a type of polytheism. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa says, um, uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'an illa ayyushraka bih. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all sins except for one, that you may associate partners with him. And it's a type of polytheism for a simple reason. You were not created, your God is still Allah, right? Because he created you, your whims and desires did not bring you into existence. So there is still that part that you have to contend with now, that Allah created you, but now you're rejecting Allah and you're worshipping something else. That something else is your own whims and desires. It could be a, an idol, it could be whatever it is. And when the message came to you, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We were not going to punish anybody until we send a message, a messenger. Um, so the message comes to you, and then you recognize the message, you recognize its truth. It was, it was sent to you in your own language, in your own ways of expression, so that you can understand it properly. It's like Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ That we have not sent a messenger except in the tongue. And here, tongue talks about language and forms of expression and culture and whatnot. So it comes to you in the way that you would understand it. So that it becomes clear to you. And you still rejected it. So now you've made a choice. Knowing full well the consequences of that choice. So the choice to go to hell is not Allah's choice. The choice is the disbeliever's choice. And that has to be established. With regards to justice, the crime itself, how do you know the weight of the crime? Where do you get the concept of the heaviness or the weightiness of the crime so that you can decide after that what type of punishment that crime necessitates? This is the new Mu'tazila, the new uh, Mu'tazila type of thinking that Muslims have fallen into. The Sunni position is that justice is not something that you project onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Justice is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines. So you could say, for example, let's say like with the Sharia rulings, um, one of them uh, with regards to theft, if all of the conditions, which are very limited, by the way, and, and very difficult to ascertain all of this, but let's say that you have a situation where um, somebody, they're governing by Islamic rule and you hear stories uh, from the history of the, of the Islamic tradition that somebody had their hand cut off because they because Allah says in the Quran that the, the, the one who's the, the thief uh, the male and the female thief if all the conditions are met and they indeed have committed the crime and it passes the minimum amount and they break into somebody's home and they do all of the things that necessitate this final conclusion of a punishment of cutting off the hand. Your emotional state right now as you hear about this is getting riled up. Oh my God, what if they just give back the money? You know, what if they just do this? But that's not up to you. That's why when the, the man came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he brought a thief with him and he said, this person stole my cloak from me. And when the Prophet ﷺ ascertained that, he's like, that's the punishment. And so the guy, the companion said, no, no, all right, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it as a gift now. I don't want it anymore. And he ﷺ said, you should have done that before you come to me. But now that the crime has been now announced and it's established and this person has done it, you cannot have in a society this thing becoming manifest. And there are multiple sociological explanations people come up with to show um, how grave of a crime it is and, and so the punishment end up we try to in our own human way try to show that the crime the punishment of cutting the hand now is going to fit the crime but at the end of the day as a believer and if you've established your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly and you establish your belief in the Quran properly you just recognize that sh you know based on the legal principles and the legal requirements and, and that the state is the one doing this not some vigilantes and you got everything in place that this is this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stipulated. That's the punishment. And that punishment fits the crime.
Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who determines what is just. It's not me. My information, my knowledge is limited by space and time and context and culture and so much. My emotions, you know, what, what drives me emotionally is partly driven by the culture that I grew up in. So what makes, yeah, there is shared human emotions, of course, universal human emotions, but there are also ones that are not shared. For example, disgust. Disgust is not shared across the planet. What you find disgusting in, let's say, Indonesia is not necessarily going to be the same thing that somebody in uh, California is going to find disgusting and vice versa. So you can't project your own sense of what you think is just onto Allah. How do you know what is just? You have to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you go back to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to determine what is just. So that's with regards to the issue of justice. With regards to the issue of mercy, there are, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that he's going to forgive all sins, he can forgive all sins, that you have a hadith where Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying to you that uh, whoever says la ilaha illallah, whoever says there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that that person, anybody who says that, that person enters into paradise, what more mercy do you want? You know, what more mercy are you looking for? So you're, you're contending with multiple issues, Abdullah, and whoever is interested in the subject, the issue of free will, the issue of justice, the issue of mercy, the issue of um, uh, where justice is derived from, the issue of uh, confusing between confusion between all merciful and all loving, the issue of projecting your own emotional state onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then I think I mentioned in the video, I don't recall, but the issue of the disbeliever living their life in a way, the analogy I gave, if I recall correctly, that I did give it, uh, was uh, those uh, plants that only grow in, in extreme heat and fire. Through an evolution process, there are types of plants, species of plants in the California forest. I can't remember the name of the species now, now that I think about it, but um, these species, they do not grow. They, their seeds will not germinate until there is intense heat and fire and smoke is present. And when the heat and fire and smoke goes away, these seeds finally can grow into new trees. But then their seeds won't germinate again. They can't produce again until they have another round of fire. So if you want to talk about changing skin to new skin to new skin, this is the analogy to think of. You have through an evolutionary process, these seeds and these plants and this from this particular species to become new species, to get new trees and to exchange new seeds and to go through that process, they needed fire. And they evolved in a way to, because there is lots of California fires over the years because of the heat and whatnot. So you have, just through adaptation, you have a new species that evolves into that way. In the same way, a disbeliever who chooses out of their own will, despite receiving a proper message, that this is how they want to live their life, they're now evolving and developing themselves and their soul in a way that their soul actually needs to be in the fire. And they've made that choice. And yes, they're going to experience the torture and do all of that stuff. But that's their decision. That is not Allah's decision because Allah gave free will to the human being. I hope you're going to have to sit on this for a while, by the way. Just you listening to this explanation. There are many questions that are popping up in your head. Many, but what about what abouts? You need to just let this settle and sit on it for a while and just think about it. And it will start to come together for you once you really consider this. But for now, I hope this is sufficient. And for now, I'm going to close off because this has been going on for a while. I got a little excited because it's like it's been a while since I recorded. So I just wanted to record and just answer as many questions as possible. There were a lot of questions on Facebook. Um, that I just couldn't get to, um, but I felt that these were the ones that I mentioned here had the most kind of general applicability. So I hope it has been beneficial for you guys. Please continue to send your questions. Uh, Facebook, uh, again, I get a lot. So if I'm not responding to you, I'm not ignoring you. It just takes a long time to write to you know hundreds of people back, and I just can't do that. So I, I do read it, and I do appreciate the reach out, and I really appreciate the support and. Um, I, you know, I make du'a for all you guys, so please make du'a for me. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that, I guess. And then we'll get back to our regularly scheduled programming with the different topics that I talk about starting next week, inshallah. Hopefully this was beneficial. With that, I will bid you adieu for the week. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa atubu